If you have been following the recent events in the war in Ukraine, you know that, one, the initiative is still in the hands of Russia, and two, that the territorial gains are also going in that direction. That status report comes with an important caveat, though. Those gains are coming slowly. You will see what I mean in a minute. But I think that both of these aspects are worth talking about in greater depth. That is, why Russia is advancing, and why the pace is so slow. Indeed, the explanations speak not only to what the world might see in the future, but they also may help us understand why things played out as they did over the past year. That is why today, we are going to begin with a quick update about what has gone on over the last month on the ground, then discuss why Russia is still on the move, with a focus on the role of trenches in this war. And finally, we will wrap up with the big lingering question of why Russia is not going any faster. But we start with an update of what is happening on the ground. When Russia captured Avdivka last month, we discussed how it did not leave available any obvious follow-on attacks for Russia. In other words, this was not going to be a situation where one domino toppled a bunch of others, like was the case with Ukraine's 2022 counter-offensives. Sure enough, we are seeing this. Yes, Russia is on the initiative. But for Ukraine, nothing close to a collapse is happening. Over the course of March, Russia captured 0.01% of internationally recognized Ukrainian territory. The gains came mostly from hard-fought turf battles west of Avdivka, west of Bakhmut, and near the Kharkiv-Luhansk Oblast border. Now, by itself, 0.01% does not sound like much. And indeed, going back to February, it is less than the 0.02% that Russia captured that month. By further comparison, during Ukraine's failed 2023 offensive, it recaptured 0.85% of its territory. And since Russia took the initiative in December, only 0.04% of territory has gone in the other direction. If you think that seems inconsistent with media coverage, you are not alone. I too felt the need to double-check. Part of the discrepancy between perception and reality here is because of what has exchanged hands. Recall how Ukraine's 2023 strategy was to try to drive a wedge across Russia's Crimean land bridge. That meant that Ukraine put pressure on small towns that were of little direct consequence. Rather, they were designed as stepping stones for something bigger that just never came to fruition. In contrast, Russia's main thrust over the winter was directly aimed at a target of value. Basically, this is the war version of those county-based electoral maps, which require the reminder that land does not vote, people do. This comes with the notable caveat that cities like Bakhmut and Evdivka have essentially become uninhabitable wastelands over the course of the war. They are better than taking possession of an empty field, often because they are at the intersection of larger roadways, but they are not as directly valuable as they may seem. In any case, none of this is coming close to what was going on earlier in the war. Russia captured 10.75% and 7.88% over the first two months of the invasion. Then Ukraine returned 5.54% over April 2022. And somehow, these are still exaggerated in size, because I cannot make the pixels any smaller without risking them disappearing completely. The recent numbers also look small compared to Ukraine's 2022 counter-offensive, featuring 1.67%, 0.45%, and 0.73% over successive months. Thus, the key point here, at least from a perspective of territorial control, is that things are going well for Russia. On the other hand, they are not going particularly well. In turn, we have two related points to address. First, why is Russia still gaining ground? And second, why isn't Russia gaining more ground? The first of those is easier to answer, so we begin there. 
Why does Ukraine remain on the back foot? There are a few sub-answers to that, one of which receives by far the most attention, one getting increasing attention, and one that remains in the shadows. Let's get the best-known one out of the way quickly. Put simply, Ukraine has been feeling the pain of a weapons crunch for a long time now. Artillery shells have been the main focus here. You need a ton of them to defend well, and you need even more of them to successfully gain ground. The shortage contributed to Ukraine's underwhelming offensive last year, and Russia taking the initiative is basically the follow-on to that. The glide bomb part has received more attention in recent weeks. Basically, Russia is taking 1,500 kilogram bombs, dropping them out of aircraft more than 40 kilometers from their targets, and then letting the ordnance glide toward the enemy. Because of the distance, it is hard for Ukraine to impose countermeasures, and the amount of damage from a 1,500 kilogram bomb far exceeds what standard artillery can do. Kyiv contends that this is again a consequence of slow-moving Western aid. That if Ukraine had F-16s, Russian planes would be more cautious taking to the skies, even if Russia is dropping the bombs from well behind the front lines. The more subtle part is Ukraine's lack of defensive fortifications. This is less of an unforced error today, as much as it is a consequence of what is probably best described as a mistake, from almost a year and a half ago. When Russia retreated from Kherson in November 2022, General in Charge Sergei Surovikin placed the focus on building defensive fortifications along the front lines. Ukraine did not take the same measures. Now, why this is the case is a good question. Obviously, as a starting point, Kyiv's focus was on preparing for an offensive in 2023. Maybe the story here is one of limited resources, and there was just not enough manpower to build defense in depth across the entire front line. There may also be a political dimension to this, where defensive entrenchments, with an emphasis on the defensive part, risked creating the perception that Kyiv was implicitly accepting the line of control as the new status quo. Then there is the suggestion that, if you intend an offensive to be successful, then any time spent building entrenchments is a waste of time. Now, trying to adjudicate among those explanations, that last argument does not have much merit. I know this seems a little counterintuitive at first, but if you want to build out a maximal offense, you actually need something strong to fall back on. Broadly speaking, countries have to decide how to allocate their soldiers between offensive and defensive activities. It is true that putting all of your resources into the offense maximizes the chances that an offensive will succeed, but it also creates the highest downside risk. If, for some reason, the opponent succeeds in quashing the offensive, all of those resources are gone, and now the initiating state is completely vulnerable to a counterattack. As a result, planners must strike the right balance between the two. And here is the key. The better your entrenchments are, the better return you get for each soldier who stays behind. But that is just a complicated way of saying that you do not need as many people on defense, so you can just cheat some portion of them over to the offense. Thus, a better defense implies a better offense. But again, Ukraine did not work much on the entrenchments. And actually, this may help explain what went wrong during last year's offensive for Ukraine. The United States desperately wanted Ukraine to form up in a single location and push through Russian lines to create a breakthrough there. Ukraine instead chose to spread out and attack multiple fronts at once. What may have been going on here is that Ukraine was avoiding the casinos and intentionally opting for the less risky strategy. The upshot there is that it is hard for something to go catastrophically wrong when you do not have all of your eggs in one basket. And if you are worried about that sort of thing because you do not have defense in depth, well, maybe you want to avoid congregating in one area. Regardless, Ukraine now finds itself in a tight spot. Trenches are not as easy to build as they were in yesteryear. There was a time when all you primarily wanted was a line of fire on your opponent, with an absolute minimum of your body exposed. 
Hence, we have the classic image of a trench. It is a pit that you put your body into. Head and gun go over the top, but everything else is protected. In today's world, though, that is just an invitation for a quadcopter to fly over you, drop a grenade, and then, well, that's the ball game. The key point is that Ukraine will need time to develop good entrenchments, which explains why Russia has been gaining ground, and suggests that this trend may continue over the short term. But then we also have the fact that Russia's gains have been slow, and this part is a bit harder to explain. Not for a lack of possible explanations, but rather a lack of clarity on which is driving it. One explanation that we can be fairly confident in ruling out is mud. Mud will forever be a part of the story of this war, and it is currently the rainy season in Ukraine. But Russia's gains were also slow back in February, when things were frostier, and thus better for movement. Now, there should still be cause for concern in Kyiv that things will get worse come the more pleasant late spring season. But something else must be going on here, and still the question is what? A better possibility is that the slow movement is an artifact of Ukraine's conservative strategy from the offensive. Again, it failed in the sense that not only did the blue and yellow soldiers fail to reach the coastline, they barely made any headway at all in the offensive. But it did not fail in the sense that there are no more Ukrainians, period. The upshot is that perhaps Kyiv worried about its lack of preparations, held manpower back, and is now reaping the benefits of not hemorrhaging ground in the aftermath. This raises a deeper question, though. If we know that Russia's fortifications were good, and if the proof is in the pudding, then we know that they were, then Russia ought to be putting more effort into the current offensive. In other words, Russia should be putting the offensive ball directly into the hole, rather than punting the major advances to a later date. Wordplay aside, this should cancel out, to some degree, Ukraine's defensive reserve. Maybe Moscow has some concern that this summer will be different if Ukraine has an influx of weapons aid, but that is pure speculation. Another explanation is that Russia is feeling the pinch of equipment and manpower losses after the capture of Avdivka. Ukraine is still on the back foot, yes, but Kyiv's attritional defensive strategy is limiting how much Russia can do with the momentum. It is possible. But the strange thing with this interpretation is that Russia continues to push, seemingly without the numbers that would allow the Kremlin to reach a minimally acceptable goal. Well, I suppose they will get there eventually, but we will all be dead from old age well before then. Last month, we could reason that the absence of a mobilization was due to Russia's presidential election. We are now many weeks past that, so still too early to draw any firm conclusions about whether a repeat of September 2022's mass mobilization is politically feasible. But we do have a hint here. Russia announced its twice-yearly standard conscription, which is unrelated to the war, during that period. This would have been a good time to add, say, 100,000 soldiers to the total, and declare that a small percentage of new recruits may go to Ukraine. Instead, Russia stuck to its standard quantities, and directly stated that those call-ups would not leave for the war zone. Now, I know what you are thinking. Indeed, it is possible that the Kremlin could increase the number in secret, and then accidentally send them to Ukraine anyway. The former part is easier because it is hard for a third party to audit exactly how many soldiers are coming in. Reneging on the latter part, however, is playing with fire, and if done in bulk, would create a lot of domestic resistance to the regime. And it is worth noting that there is some speculation that Russia has naturally regenerated its numbers, even if those soldiers are not as capable as the previous batch. In fact, NATO's Supreme Allied Commander of Europe now says that the Russian army is 15% larger than at the start of the invasion. A final possibility is that Russia has just not rebounded to the extent that it seems. Now, it is clear that the Russian armed forces are not in the same level of disarray as when the invasion of Kyiv began. The failure there was a wake-up call, and the Russian house is at least somewhat in order once more. 
Moscow has also had the better part of a year to reorganize, after the Wagner Group's thunder run on the capital. Perhaps the capture of Avdivka speaks more to Ukraine's vulnerability in that particular location, rather than a broader weakness that Russia could exploit further. But again, this is pure speculation. Why do you think Russia is making slow progress? Let me know in the comments. If you want to make rapid progress in learning more about the war, check out these cool books that I've written on the subject. And if you enjoyed this video, please like, share, and subscribe, and I will see you next time. Take care.